In this video on electrolysis, we are going to explain how the process of electrolysis works, predict the products of electrolysis for both molten and dissolved electrolytes, and explain which ions have been reduced or oxidised, and you only need to do that if you're studying the higher tier course. Electrolysis is a method of decomposing ionic compounds by passing an electric current through them. However, it's important to remember that ionic compounds can't conduct electricity when they are solid. This is because the ions aren't able to move around the structure, therefore they're unable to carry charge throughout that structure. So in order to do electrolysis, you need to make sure the ionic compound you're using is either molten or dissolved. Because when ionic compounds are molten or dissolved, the ions are able to move, therefore they can carry charge and conduct electricity. Depending whether your electrolyte, what you're doing electrolysis on, is molten or dissolved, you'll get different products in electrolysis. In the first part of this video, we're going to look at what happens if you use a molten electrolyte. In the second half, we're going to look at what happens if you use aqueous or dissolved electrolytes. We're now going to look at how electrolysis works. You will do a practical as part of the course, but this is a simple diagram showing what the electrolysis equipment looks like. The key feature of electrolysis are these two electrodes. They're a solid which can conduct electricity, so one's connected up to a battery. They allow an electrical current to pass from the battery, through the electrodes, through the electrolyte, back up the electrode to complete the circuit. One electrode is positive and the other electrode is negative. The positive electrode is called the anode and the negative electrode is called the cathode. You need to remember the names of these electrodes. To help you remember the names, we use the word PANIC. This stands for positive anode, negative is cathode. So you know the positive electrode is called the anode, the negative electrode is called the cathode. Finally, the electrolyte is the liquid or solution that we use in electrolysis. So it's either the molten ionic compound or the ionic compound dissolved in water. We're now going to look in a little bit more detail at how electrolysis works. So remember that electrolysis works on an ionic compound, so for example, sodium chloride. It's also important to remember that an ionic compound has a metal and a non-metal in it. The metal ion is always going to be positive, and the non-metal ion will always be negative. The positive ion, the metal ion, is going to be attracted to the negative electrode, because opposites attract. So the positive will move to the cathode. The non-metal ion, the negative ion, will move to the positive electrode because again, opposites attract, so the negative ion will move over to the anode. For example then, I've labelled a positive and negative electrode, the anode and the cathode, and I've shown the metal as the M positive ion, and the non-metal as the NM minus ion. The positive metal ion would move to the negative electrode, the cathode, the negative non-metal ion would move over to the positive electrode, the anode. We're now going to look at a worked example of determining the products of molten copper chloride. Remember the products are different whether you do it in molten or aqueous conditions. So we're looking at molten copper chloride. The first step is to break the ionic compound down into two parts. So we're going to look at the copper and the chloride part separately. The copper is a metal, so it will be positive. And the chloride a non-metal so it will be negative. 
Because opposite charges attract, the positive copper will be attracted to the negative electrode, which is the cathode. Likewise, the negative chloride ion will be attracted to the anode, because the anode is the positive electrode. This means that at the cathode we will produce copper metal. At the anode we will produce chlorine gas. Note that we started off with a chloride ion but we'll make chlorine gas. Just like if we had bromide we'd make bromine gas. If we had oxide we would make oxygen gas. So again, I've labelled the diagram with a positive and negative electrode, and I've added some copper ions in the solution and some chloride ions. The copper ions would move to the negative electrode, and the chloride ions would move to the positive electrode. This slide looks at redox, which is just for students studying the higher tier exam. So redox means reduction and oxidation. You might have already come across this in your lessons earlier on in this topic. To remember what redox stands for and what reduction and oxidation are, we can use oil rig. This helps us remember that oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. So if something loses electrons, we can say that it's been oxidised. If something gains electrons, we can say that it's been reduced. In electrolysis, the ions that we have, so for example the copper ion and the chloride ion, will turn into atoms and molecules. In order to go from the ion to the molecule, a negative ion will need to lose electrons. It's negative because it's got an extra electron, so in order to get rid of its negative charge and go from being in a negative ion back to a molecule, it needs to lose an electron. This means the negative ion will be oxidised because it's losing electrons. Because we know that the negative ions will move to the positive electrode, we can say that oxidation will happen at the anode. In order to turn the positive ions back into an atom, they're going to need to gain electrons. They have a positive charge because they don't have enough electrons, they've already lost electrons. So to get rid of that positive charge, we've got to add some more electrons to them. Because remember, electrons have a negative charge. So because the positive ions need to gain electrons, we can say that they will be reduced, because reduction is the gain of electrons. Again, since opposites attract, we know the positive ions will move to the negative electrode, so we can say that reduction will happen at the cathode. We're now going to work through the copper chloride example again, but this time focusing on reduction and oxidation. As before, it's best to treat each part of this separately. So like we looked at in the early example, copper is a metal, so it's going to be positive. So it's going to move to the cathode, which is the negative electrode. The chloride is a non-metal, so it's negative. So it's going to move to the anode, which is the positive electrode. In order to lose its positive charge, the copper needs to gain electrons. So we can say that at the cathode, the copper will be reduced. In order to lose its negative charge, the chlorine needs to lose electrons, so we can say that it is oxidised. At the anode, the chlorine is oxidised because it has lost electrons. So far we've talked about how to determine the products if we do electrolysis on a molten ionic compound. We're now going to look what happens if you do it on an aqueous ionic compound instead. Aqueous just means that it's been dissolved in water. When we use water in electrolysis, we can think of the H2O as forming H plus ions and OH minus ions. 
we're going to look at what happens at the anode and cathode separately. Remember the anode is the positive electrode and the cathode is the negative electrode. So at the negative electrode, just like in the molten example, we're going to have the metal ion there, the M+. Plus. But we're also going to have a H plus ion. Because remember, our water splits apart into H plus and OH minus. H plus is positive, so it's also going to go to the negative electrode. This means we have a choice of which of these we're going to produce at the negative electrode. The way we determine which of these is produced is that whichever is the most reactive, the metal or hydrogen, will stay in solution. It will stay dissolved in the aqueous solution, which means whatever is the least reactive is going to be produced at that electrode. In order to see which is the most reactive, we can use the reactivity series. Depending on the exam question you're given, you might be given the reactivity series and asked to use it to decide what is made and what stays in solution, or the question could, for example, tell you what is made and what is stays, and then in which case you'd need to use that to determine which is the most reactive. You do not need to learn the reactivity series, though. If a question requires you to know what's more reactive, you'll be given the reactivity series. You can see the reactivity series is a list of metals, with the most reactive at the top and the least reactive at the bottom. The table also includes carbon and hydrogen. We don't need to use the carbon in this case, but we do need to know whether hydrogen is more or less reactive than the metals. So if the metal is more reactive, the metal will stay in the solution and we will produce hydrogen gas, H2. If the hydrogen is more reactive, the hydrogen ions will stay in solution and will form the metal at the electrode. Just like in the molten example, at the positive electrode, we will have our non-metal ion, because opposites attract, but we're also going to have the OH- ion. And this is because, like with the H+, plus at the negative electrode, water will split apart into H+, plus and OH-. Minus. OH- minus is negative, so will be attracted to the positive electrode. If our non-metal is in group 7, so if it's a halogen, like fluorine, chlorine, bromine or iodine, we will produce that as a gas. It's written as X2, so for example, if we produced chlorine, it would be Cl2. If we produced bromine, it would be Br2. If the non-metal is not in group 7, so for example, if it was an oxygen, which is in group 6, we would make water and oxygen gas instead at the positive electrode. We're now going to look at another worked example for this. We're going to look at copper chloride, like we did for the molten, but in this case, obviously, the copper chloride we're saying is in an aqueous solution. We set the question out, just like before, separating the metal and the non-metal. Copper is the metal, so it'll form a positive ion, so this is going to take place at the cathode, which is the negative electrode. We'll remember that when we do it in aqueous conditions, at the negative electrode, we're also going to have a hydrogen ion, H+. So in order to determine which of these stays and which is made, we need to look at which is the most reactive. To do this, we'll use the reactivity series again. So we'll find where copper is and where hydrogen is. We can see that hydrogen is above copper in the reactivity series, therefore hydrogen is more reactive than copper. Because hydrogen is more reactive, the hydrogen is going to stay dissolved in the solution. So because the hydrogen stays in the solution, this means that the copper is going to be produced at the electrode. So you'd see some copper metal at the negative electrode. Chloride is the non-metal, so it's negative, so you'd find it going to the anode, which is the positive electrode. Chlorine is in group 7 of the periodic table, so we're going to produce Cl2 gas. 
We're now going to look at another worked example of what products will form from an aqueous solution when we do electrolysis on it. This time we're going to look at sodium oxide. As before, it's easy to separate out the metal and the non-metal parts of the ionic compound. Sodium is a metal, which means it's going to form a positive ion, which means this is going to take place at the cathode, the negative electrode. As well as having the sodium ion, we know that we're also going to have a hydrogen ion because we're doing this in aqueous conditions. We then need to determine which of these metals is the most reactive, so we'll use the reactivity series again. Here we can see that sodium is above hydrogen in the reactivity series. This means that sodium is the most reactive out of the two. Because sodium is the most reactive, it's going to stay dissolved in the solution, which means that we're going to produce H2 gas instead at the negative electrode. So the oxide is a non-metal, so it's going to be negative, so it means these reactions are going to take place at the positive electrode, the anode. Oxygen is not in group 7, so we're going to make water and oxygen gas. Now, we're producing the oxygen gas just because the non-metal is not in group 7, not because it's oxygen. So as long as your non-metal is not in group 7, you're always going to produce water and oxygen gas. So let's review what we've covered. We've explained how electrolysis works. We've explained what the electrolyte is and what the electrodes are called. We've predicted the products of electrolysis when we carry it out in molten conditions and then when we carry it out in aqueous conditions. And we've looked at which ions will have been reduced or oxidized. But remember, you only need to do that part if you're sitting the higher tier paper.